T. David Gordon. His actual first name is Thomas. I think we're among friends, so we can disclose that. Uh, Thomas David Gordon, I'll do a brief introduction because we always have newcomers and they may not be familiar with Dr. Gordon. He is a distinguished professor, professor who taught at Grove City College for 20 years, I think. I'm close, yeah. Uh, he taught Greek there. He um, uh, also was in uh, Biblical Studies Department and uh, taught Media Ecology. He's a very, very learned uh, fellow and a wonderful man uh, who has taught many, many classes here. He was last here a year ago when he taught a cl uh, class on the life of Paul, which is still up on our website. You could watch it. It was fantastic. He's a past guest on our podcast uh, where we learned of his affection for hiking in the woods and sleeping overnight on a hammock, which uh, I guess you'll do this fall, right? Uh, he is a native Virginian, author, pastor, professor, and reformed theologian. Uh, as I mentioned, he retired from Grove City after a long tenure there. He, before that, he taught New Testament and Greek at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, which is where Rick Walling got his uh, doctorate. And before that, he pastored a PCA church in Nashua, New Hampshire, for a decade. And he received his bachelor de bachelor's degree from Roanoke College, his master's degree from Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, and his doctorate from Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. So you have someone who is, is as reformed as it gets, um, which is why we invite him back so often. It's only one of the reasons. It's only one of the reasons. He's a marvelous speaker. Uh, he, and he's the author of many well-known books, including one that puts the fear of God into um, pastors, Why Johnny Can't Preach, uh, The Media Have Shaped the Messengers. That came out in 2009. It was a very, very big book. And Why Johnny Can't Sing, Hymns, uh, How Pop Culture Rewrote the Hymnal. That came out in 2010. And the class that he's teaching us for today, that he begins for the next five weeks, he taught formerly at Grove City College many times, I believe, uh, to great, great critical acclaim. Uh, I was told that it was the, one of the most favorite classes that he taught there. Speaking on vocation, T. David, welcome. Uh, just a quick round of applause for him, I think, is appropriate. And... Uh, he will begin us with a word of prayer. Thanks, Tom. Let us pray. We thank you, our Heavenly Father, who knows the end from the beginning, uh, that uh, a certain orderliness is part of your nature and therefore ours as your image. We thank you for how a properly written novel introduces us uh, to its themes and tone early on, and a well-produced piece of music does the same. As we give our attention to the opening chapters of Holy Scripture, uh, we pray that you would give us uh, eyes to see and ears to hear uh, the remarkable truths that we discover there, and that the result of our discovery would help us to live more fully in your image, all of which we ask through him who loved us and gave himself for, for us, even our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, it's, uh, for the non-panicking uh, 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 information. For those of you who haven't suffered through my teaching before, you may find it uh, um, startling to find three handouts, two of which are two pages. That will only happen, as far as I can tell, the first week, right? Most of the rest of the weeks, on a single page, front and back, we will cover the material. And so part of the reason we're doing that is I wish to introduce the course itself today and then to introduce a little bit about the challenges of interpreting biblical narrative, since we will be focusing primarily on the introductory chapters from Genesis 1 and 2. And then once that's aside, we will turn to what is actually today's topic and then go on from there. So if you have those three things, you'll note one of them is a single page just on the front. That's the outline for the course. And so each of the Roman numerals on the left-hand side 
refer to the weeks. And so today is Roman numeral one, next week Roman numeral two, and so forth. So if you are the kind of person who likes to see where we're headed, uh, that may help you as we go along. So then uh, today we would be covering an introduction to the course, a few important definitions, and a word or two about interpreting the historical books. And so that's your second uh, handout, um, is interpreting the historical books of the Bible that I want to say a few words about in a moment. Because different cultures have different conventions for how they go about the process of doing history. And one of the things that makes it challenging to read ancient materials, especially probably originally composed orally, is their conventions are so different than ours. And so our expectations are different and we find ourselves like dance partners who are awkward at first because uh, they've got a 3-4 rhythm and we've got a 4-4 and something has to give at that point. So we'll say a word about that. And then we turn our attention to the substance of today's lecture, introducing us to labor and leisure and Christian perspective um, as the Lord wills. And then I normally try to finish in time uh, for Q&A a little bit. And so one of the things you may do if you're thinking about it, um, if there's a point that you'd like to see developed further or applied to a question you have, make a little marginal note and put a little question mark or something there, right? Now that question mark, if you want to make it really big, you can write it over the whole thing and say, I have no idea what this man's talking about. That's fine. <laughs> it happens with some frequency. But you could also put a little question mark in the margin so that later during the Q&A, you could just go back and say, well, there's where I wrote a question mark. I'd like to have that matter addressed a little further, if you wish. So uh, that's what we plan to do. Um, so if you look then at the, uh, the first of those, the uh, outline of the entire course, all five weeks, notice that after today's introductions, we intend to look at uh, Genesis 1 uh, next week and Genesis 2 uh, the week after that. And then Genesis 4, uh, we deal with what I call the tension between uh, Jeremiah uh, 29 and Romans 12, because after the fall, right, once we're in the fallen era beyond creation, there's this tension that the human is still a social being working cooperatively with others as image of God who works triunely, right? And yet those with whom we cooperate sometimes are at odds with us in their goals for human culture. And so how do we become both culture affirming and culture wary? That's the tension of Jeremiah 29 and Romans 12. So we do that on uh, our penultimate week. And then finally, uh, pursuing our divine calling in all of life, whether labor or leisure. And uh, I would have jumped right to that, and, and when I uh, taught this material and material like it for years at Grove City, I often jumped straight into that fifth point and then realized that almost every time I did it, there were questions that backed us back up. And after a while, I realized rather than start and then back up, let's just go ahead and back up from the start, <laughs> and then, then we don't have to back up later, and we can lay a foundation, hopefully, that will enable us uh, to get there. So just a little bit of introductory uh, material for the course itself. As you know, vocation is just an English word that was derived from Latin. Most of our English words were derived from French, but a good chunk of them come from Latin and other earlier languages. And French itself is, of course, informed by Latin in, in parts. But vocatio is just the noun in Latin that means call or calling. And uh, it has verbal forms of that as well. So when we talk about our vocations, we are talking about uh, what we are called to. And the purpose of this five-week study together is to sort of uh, shift directions. If you go into a Christian bookstore and see books on calling or vocation, they are almost always addressed to uh, what I would call emerging adults uh, and helping them find good, solid Christian principles for determining what profession they should pursue. And there's a place for that, right? But it has to be located not only within what you are called to do, but what humans are called to do and be. And then later, many times through life, we have different chapters in our life where our vocation changes. Non-parents have a different calling than parents do. And then parents for 20 to 25 to 28 years have this enormous calling of caring for the home. And then when the children leave the nest, as it were, their calling shifts another time. And when they retire professionally from their previous employer, their calling shifts again. And, but all of those callings, if they are legitimate, are grounded in what God called the human to do and called the human to be. 
And as, as I've d read the literature through the years, uh, I, I've been sort of unhappily impressed with the fact that the personal sense of call is not grounded in our common human sense of calling. And I think actually it opens up the field of the personal call substantially if you understand what God called the human to do and be. Then you can see through the various moments in your life how you can pursue both in labor and in leisure, and I probably emphasize the latter, uh, that per perhaps both in labor and in leisure, we're simply trying to be human and to do what God called humans to do. So we're trying to be the image of God, and we're trying to do the kinds of things the image of God does. And if our particular professional responsibilities cultivate some aspects of the image of God, all well and good. But if our professional duties don't cultivate important aspects of the image of God, that's the role of leisure in our lives. Leisure is the part of our life that does not belong to our employer. And the way I view it as it's that part of our life where we can compensate for what our labor doesn't do for us. If labor leaves us less well-formed as a human, then leisure is a chance to alter that. So imagine if you were, if you're a research librarian, either for an academic institution or for a medical firm or something else, and you spend most of your time in front of a computer screen reading through journal articles and finding them and compiling bibliographies and so forth, you're pretty much in a cubbyhole working by yourself. And so that aspect of the human made in God's image that is social, because God is everlastingly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that part of us that is so social that God, having said six times it is good, and creation says in Genesis 2, it is not good that man should be alone, you see. It is so woven into our nature. And so a person who works in front of the computer screen all day long doing this kind of a thing might decide in her free time, in her leisure time, to join a community chorus, and that would be nice, something like that, or a community band, do music. They might uh, become a den mother, and this kind of a thing. But they would probably, or even a quilting bee, right? But they might choose deliberately to do with their leisure time something that augments and compensates for what is missing in the professional part. So most of what you will see in Christian bookstores about vocation have to do with merely your own personal professional calling. And I'm suggesting that even pursuing that is better done if you understand our common human calling and then also understand how leisure augments labor as a means to that end. And so uh, we, you will recall now almost immediately that the word call appears in the Genesis narrative, right? It's, it's common in the Genesis narrative as we see. And he called the light day and he called the darkness night. And so he calls things, he names them, and you recall he puts Adam in, in the garden and t to see what he would name the things, you see, and that's in Hebrew it's call, it's the same verb, kara, that uh, he wants to see if uh, Adam will emulate him in naming things well. And his first opportunity is for his wife, isn't it? And he called her name Ewa, for she was the mother of all living. Right? What a wonderful honoring and a appropriate title. He called her Ewa the mother of all living. And so he called her, you see, something that's important to her purpose. And, and so he emulated God in seeing the created order and naming it and calling it appropriate things. So that's a general introduction to the course. Um, let me say a few words, if I may, about interpreting the historical books of the Bible. You'll see an extended quote from my old former colleague, uh, Meredith Klein, Gordon Conwell. And uh, yeah, <laughs> it, uh, uh, Meredith passed away. It was either late 06 or early 07. I think it was the spring of 06. So uh, he was there for all of my years from uh, 1984 to 1998, I suppose it was, um, and a good friend. And uh, the, the uh, page numbers on my citation come from his earlier edition that was actually printed at the print shop at Gordon Conwell Seminary in 2006 or 7 or 8. The book came out again, uh, published by Whip and Stock. And if you get the Whip and Stock edition, which is the only one currently available, my page numbers and theirs probably won't align perfectly. Uh, but then, since I have that copy, the copy that I got from Meredith when he was still living, uh, uh, that's the copy I still use uh, while I get uh, another one. So note then, uh, it's, so it's marvelous. It's, it's just a great work. Many of us find that it's the kind of thing we like to go back and reread every five to six years. It, it's, it's, yes, yeah, that's right, yeah, that, that, that's right, that, uh, yeah, it does, and, and 
and Meredith's works are all so rich that I'm not sure on the first washing we get all the wet, right? We have to go back again and get some more in it. Uh, so one of the, the most peculiar things about the biblical narratives that uh, Meredith and others call attention to is they make no effort to be uh, equal in their treatment of every event. Now, by the 20th century, and perhaps even earlier, uh, if a person was covering uh, the war between the states, um, they would give roughly equal time for uh, the Vicksburg campaign, the Northern Virginia campaigns, these kinds of things, Antietam and the like. Uh, and they would certainly, uh, Shelby Foote wouldn't have omitted any of those important things. Uh, but with uh, ancient historians, uh, they just basically don't give much press to the small potatoes. They're big potato people. And so what happens then is if you were to look at the biblical narrative, all the historical books in the narrative from Genesis through the Acts of the Apostles, what you would find is there are certain moments in Israel's history where there's an enormous amount of verbiage, and then other moments when there's very little. An enormous amount about the original contest in the Israelite monarchy between Saul, their first king, and then David. And very early, you see, in Saul's ministry, there's the declaration through the prophet that the kingship will be taken away from him. But it doesn't disappear, does it, quickly? He, he has many wars with David and David's lieutenants and so forth. This goes on for quite a while. And so uh, the, that whole thing, how will this monarchy work out, you see, is really expanded in the early years. But then later when you're reading some of the portions in First and Second Chronicles and First and Second Kings, they'll cover some Israelite or Judahite king in like two sentences. It said, you know, during his reign, the people went after the high places and God was displeased. And that's it, right? You go, wow, that's brief. So uh, one of the things we realized then is if we had a timeline of all the events in the history from 1500 BC until roughly the first century of the Common Era, uh, we would not find equal coverage to everything. And so some things are drawn out in the narrative and some things are not. And that sort of throws us for a small loop because we expect a kind of equality of treatment. But that expectation was not followed by ancient cultures. So one of the most interesting things about Meredith's quote there, by the way, I, not he, am responsible for the error in the final paragraph there. It's 2 Peter 3, 5 through 7. Uh, Meredith knew the Bible better than I did and was less prone to have typos. I think this was just my little finger wasn't long enough to get to the right number. <laughs> and so it got a, got a one where it should be two Peter. But he calls attention to this remarkable thing um, that the, uh, how brief this is. And uh, right after the citation of 2 Peter 3, 5 through 7, he says, There, 2 Peter 3, 5 through 7, There, all of man's history on earth is, in divided, is divided into two at the flood. As a separate world history by themselves, the history of another world that preceded the present world. The apostle speaks of the world that then was, the original heavens and earth created by the word of God, a world that perished in the judgment of the flood. And he sets that pre diluvian world over against the present heaven and earth, the world produced at the flood, which is also moving toward a destiny of divine judgment. The Greek's really elegant there. It actually says, the then world. Hatate cosmos, it says, the then world, perished, right, in the divine judgment. And then he refers to what is after that as the world that now is, right? And so if you look at the Genesis narrative, there's a great deal more to cover the world that now is than the world that then was. It's only the first nine chapters that deal with the world that then was. But Peter refers to them as though they're equal. It's perfectly natural to his language to assume that the, the world that then was had a history as long as the world that now is. But we only get it in nine chapters of the Hebrew Bible. So uh, you'll note then when I mention on the bottom of the second page the third part of Genesis, how it's divided into the ten, these are the generations is, right? You'll note that I left a gap there at one point, didn't I? And that wasn't a mistake. That wasn't due to small fingers not hitting the keys accurately. This was intentional because, you see, at the end of the first ones that appear before it, those three, what comes after is the post-flood. So that 
in elegant double space there is my way of acknowledging 2 Peter 3, 5 through 7. The earlier parts are the world that then was, and the latter parts all the way to the end of the book of Revelation are the world that now is. And you can read Meredith's quote at some point on at your own uh, liberty and see, but he basically suggests it's entirely plausible that the world had a, as long as or longer history prior to the flood judgment as it has had since then. After, afterward, how, however, the message of redemption and how God will eventually rescue the human race from the curses of Genesis 3 occupies the narrative. And the, all that previous stuff that happened, when all the thoughts of the heart of man were only evil continually that led to the flood judgment, Merida suggests that could have easily been three or four or five times as long historically as the world that now is. And that's just mind-blowing to think about that. And so I leave it there and represent it through the double space so you can see that that's why that's done. So if we could turn then to the structure of Genesis, there's a large measure of agreement about how the book is structured into a first, second, and third part. And so many people think the first two verses are the first part, where the entirety of the material order is referred to in two brief verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was hovering upon the face of the deep. Uh, that this is the nutshell statement of the whole thing. And then the second part is what you and I normally think of as the creation narrative in Genesis 1, where you have the six uh, Arab evokers, the, the six evening and mornings, right, each of those. And so this is the second part, and you can see the common structuring. I've uh, italicized some of those things for emphasis, but you'll know that in the complete pattern on those six days, uh, you have, and uh, God said let something be, and God saw that it was good, and he called the something, something, and there was evening and morning a first day, there was evening and morning a second day, and so forth, all the way through. Now, that pattern is not repeated perfectly in all six days. Two of those six days are missing one of the four parts. Uh, one of them it doesn't say, and God saw that it was good. It, it's just implicit, I suppose. They all do have, it was evening and morning, one day, two days, this kind of a thing. And they all have God said, and they all, all but one say he saw that it was good. Uh, one of them omits that. But the pattern is there, and it's obviously a structure that uh, is repeated. The, uh, the pattern of three shorts and a long in Beethoven's Fifth Symphony goes through all four movements. It just keeps going. You still get one, two, three, one, one, two, three, one, right? So even the, in the, the triple meter, uh, it, you've got the same pattern of three shorts and a long, even when you have that nice, elegant andante movement, it still does that. And you can see the intention of this. And then the third part consists of these 10 repetitions of these are the generations of. Ela taladot. It's word for word, the same two Hebrew words, ela taladot. These are the generations. And the only exception in chapter 5 is it adds the word safer, book. Ela safer taladot. This is the book of the generations of. And so the fact that there are 10 of those structured that way, and so obviously repeating each other, is uh, a reflection of how ancient narrative is composed. Remember that they did not have books until the first century of the Common Era, as we know them. You'll see the word book in the Bible, but it was used e either to refer to scrolls, which they did have, or to codices. A codex, as you know, is a book uh, that has pages and is bound along the spine so the page is open. Prior to that, you had scrolls, like handy wipes in your kitchen. And so there was no pagination when there were scrolls, because every book was the same length, one page. <laughs> and so you had some small scrolls, and you had some big scrolls, but they were all one page, you see. And so what happened is you don't have chapter divisions and those kinds of things in ancient manuscripts. So they employ other devices to clue their readership in to what we would call chapter one or chapter two. And that's what's going on with this highly structured reality and the way Genesis is formed, not only the six days in part two, but the ten generations in part three. These are the, the way of using a, cir uh, a, a, a circumstance um, to indicate, okay, now I'm beginning a new chunk, a, a new subpoint. We're just used to having pages. By the way, the codex isn't invented until the first century of the Common Era. To the best of our knowledge, there were no codices. Uh, but prior to the first century of the Common Era. And Michael Kruger, Dr. Kruger at uh, RTS uh, Charlotte, he's worked on ancient church history, early church history, the early fathers, and canon, two wonderful books on canon. Um, he thinks that the Christians were probably the first to employ the codex, that they used it to bind together 
uh, things where they could get maybe two or three of Paul's letters in one little sheaf and send it around and so forth. So it's plausible even that uh, the Christian church was the first to use something other than scrolls uh, in its written materials. But you can see, how can you have indices and tables of contents and chapters when everything's one page long? Right? It just can't be done. And so they do other things. And Genesis, you see, has its own way of structuring its information. And uh, I'll leave that with you. And you can read Meredith's quote at some length uh, later in the week uh, at some point. And let me turn our attention to what would otherwise be our first point uh, today, and that's uh, labor and leisure and Christian perspective introducing it. So um, I said for years that Genesis 1 and 2 are like a right eye and a left eye. I think I got it right because it's inverted for you. I think, I think I inverted it for me and got it right for you. But at any rate, we have two. And uh, as you know, when, when you look at something with both eyes, you don't see a different thing. You just have a slightly different perspective on the thing, don't you? So that, you know, when you, when you do this, remember doing that when you were a child at some point, when you first realized that, hey, wait a minute, when I do that, I get something slightly different, right? And you start thinking you're weird, and your older siblings say, you are weird, right? And uh, yeah, there's something wrong with you. You should leave and go live with someone else, right? That's what, that's what old, older siblings are for. They do that kind of a thing. And then we eventually discover that other people have this same property. And so the depth perception requires the two of these and they triangulate in the brain, and the slight difference between the one and the other enables us to see depth. We can't without. We can see height, and we can see breadth, but we can't see depth without the second eye. So both Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 look at the triad, the relationship between God, the material order, and the human. They both look at the same thing. The relationship in God's creational purpose for God, the human, and the rest of the material order. Now, the emphasis is on a slightly different syllable with each one, right? So Genesis 1 describes us as the image of God, and it does so repeatedly right there, doesn't it, in 26 through 28. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So in the image of God, he made them male and female. He made them, and he blessed them. So note then that Genesis 1 refers to all three realities, but defines us more in terms of our relation to God as his image. But it also mentions the uh, material order, doesn't it? And let them have dominion over the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and the creeping things that creep upon the face of the earth. By the way, that's an ancient Hebrew euphemism for mothers-in-law because they're the creepiest things on the face of the earth. Uh, but, but not all Hebrew scholars agree, and certainly the female Hebrew scholars do not agree with my interpretation of that. So I'll leave that with you. Uh, to figure out on your own, but I like to think that those were the creeping things referred to in the Genesis narrative, uh, and, and we'll just see uh, when heaven comes what will happen. Whereas in Genesis 2, the emphasis is much more on our relation to the earth. Adam is described as being created out of the dust of the ground. He could have just said out of the dust or out of the ground, but it's out of the dust of the ground, right? And so in Genesis 2, what we find then is an enormous emphasis on uh, this earthly reality of the human. Uh, next week, we'll, we'll uh, look at that a little bit more the week after, uh, that uh, the, there are at least 20 references to ground, earth, land, dust in Genesis 2. And then if you add that Adam, the name Adam, uh, is a derivative of Adama, right? you get 15 more. So there's 35 references to the earthly soil-like realities in Genesis 2. As I put it, it's the dirtiest passage in the Bible. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and so the human is described as taken out of that reality. And this explains why your gardening friends and you who are gardeners just love to get your hands in the soil, right? It's why when I'm out in the forest, I, I love the smell of the earth that's all around me out there. It's just a lovely kind of a thing. One way or the other, all, uh, children love after a thunder shower in the summer, and the, the, the scar, skies are now blue again, you know, and things start to warm up a little bit after the thunder shower, and the little rascals are out there barefooted, squishing the mud through their toes in the front yard, aren't they, right? And those of us who are over 60 watch enviously from the front porch, right? Uh, but you can see this, and it's who we are, right? And as we'll see in the Genesis narrative, the human's relation to the earth is so significant that it even says in verse 5, um, it had not yet rained because, uh, it, no, no plant of the field had grown up because it had not rained and because there was no man to serve the ground. Isn't that interesting? As though we are as significant to the biology 
of the fauna as rain is. So it needs moisture to germinate the seeds and create chemical reactions that cause production of plants. But Genesis counts our absence equally to the absence of rain as accounting for why the earth was at that moment fruitless, because we are so significantly related to the soil, right? That's who we are. Uh, so it's, it's a remarkable thing. So I would say that Genesis 2 emphasized a little bit more than Genesis 1, our relation to the material order. Genesis 1 emphasizes a little more our relation to God, but all three are there in both narratives. And yet each eye gives us a slightly different understanding of God's creational calling for the human because each one looks at the matter in a slightly different fashion. And so in this narrative of creation, the Hebrew word kara uh, appears nine times, and he called the light day. In the darkness, he called night. And so he calls things. He doesn't just make them, but he uses two linguistic things. Let there be light, and there was light, and he called the light. So the pattern of, and he said, why Omer, and why a call, is there in almost each one of those several times again. So he pre-interprets reality by describing what he will make, and then he post-interprets it by calling it a certain thing, designating it a certain thing. So for those of you who had the misfortune of studying deconstruction at some point, you see how utterly contrary that is to the Christian reality, because deconstruction as a language can't really describe reality well. And in the Bible, language precedes reality and post-seeds reality, as it were, that uh, all of God's creative work is first linguistic, and then he does the thing, and then it's linguistic again. And so he, uh, all of material reality is bracketed with divine speech uh, in the biblical narrative. And so at least in the mind of God, there's a perfect capacity to use language to describe reality. And the human in his image strives to use language also in a manner that describes God's reality properly and notices its proper uh, uh, dimensions, I guess we would say. So as, as we will uh, work through these uh, four additional weeks, this one and the next four, uh, our, my point will be what God called us in creation is what we are. What he called us to do in creation is what we are to do. And then our brief earthly expense of 70 or 80 years and that kind of a thing, whatever it might be, or if we're the Queen 92, um, that uh, that brief expanse of life is a life in which we hope each week or each day to discover something more about the image of God within us, something that we can become and something that we can do. So notice when Tom Hanks is on the island by himself, castaway, that he has interesting conversations with Wilson, the volleyball. Was it a volleyball or a soccer ball? I was volleyball. volleyball. Okay. So I wouldn't want to offend Wilson. Uh, the, uh, so note that the part of him that is the image of God who is everlastingly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is eager to commune. And if all he's got as a soccer ball, he'll commune with the soccer ball. Right. Now, it's not as good as communing with a fellow human, but you'll see that even in that imaginative state in the film that uh, he wishes to be the image of God and to commune. One of my former students is a speech therapist in the Atlanta area now, and uh, a lot of what she deals with are stroke victims who have aphasia. And then they go through various ways to try to see if they can't stimulate the brain to create new neurological pathways so they can speak again. And the interesting thing as she observes this is uh, quite often the first people to understand the imperfect attempt to speak again are not the speech pathologists and therapists, but the spouse. The spouse who hasn't had a conversation for a year or two or three with the person with whom they shared life is now one of the first to be able to make sense of their articulation when they speak again because that is so much a part of, of who, who the human is, is our capacity to interact with one another linguistically. And the scriptures present the Godhead that way. Let us make man in our image, right? There's language, inter-Trinitarian language. And the book of life doesn't appear just in Revelation, you may recall. It appears back in Moses. May their names be written out of the book. It appears several times in the Psalms. Throughout the entirety of Scripture, the record suggests that before all eternity, before all worlds, God designated certain people as His and wrote them down in a sense, you see. They were as fixed as parchment into which Someone had chiseled a thing or inscribed a thing. And, and this is all pre-eternity. And if you look at it in the fourth gospel, for instance, 
um, the language of the inter-Trinitarian uh, compact of redemption, sometimes called the covenant of redemption, is referred to at least a dozen or more times. I can do nothing of my own accord. The Father who sent me tells me what to do and what to speak, you see. That before he incarnated, he and his Father through all eternity had compacted to redeem the lost and for him to do it in a particular way. It, and it is presented to us as a linguistic compact between the Father and the Son, probably oral rather than a written contract. I mean, who would, <laughs> who would uh, bring one to fault at court? <laughs> it's the Godhead. But they are, they are reported to us in Holy Scripture as having covenanted linguistically to rescue the lost through the incarnation, suffering, dying, and rising of the Redeemer. It's just a remarkable thing. So language is in and around all this stuff and becomes, as we will see, a big part of what it means for us to be human. So note how well created these chapters are. Um, they're, they're remarkably crafted literarily. Several different verbs for creating, making, or letting something be appear, and so there's both repetition and variety in the narrative. And so there's a certain kind of repeating certain kinds of things to kind of get the point across, but then there's also the pleasant interposition of variation in the narrative as well. And so it appears to be extremely carefully created. Uh, you note at the top of your second page there, uh, note the pattern of repetition, escalation, and negation regarding the Hebrew adjective good, tov. Five times in the creation narrative, God saw that it was tov, good. But when he makes the human in his image on the sixth and final day in which he makes, he looked at all that he's made, and behold, it is tov ma'od. It is very good. So you have good five times, and then very good once, and then you get over in Genesis 2, lo tov, not good for the man to be alone. I mean, if your ears were native Hebrew ears, you wouldn't miss this at all, Right? Uh, it would be very, very evident that what's going on, that God by his own divine standard in creation declares each of the days of creation to be good, the day in which he makes the human in his image to be very good, and then when he reflects back on the matter before the creation of Eve, because Genesis 2 stretches the narrative out into more specific detail, when he considers the human as a solipsist uh, uh, existing alone on the world, it is not good. It is not good for the man to be alone. It's not good for Tom Hanks to be alone or even his friend Wilson to be alone. Uh, though Wilson might have gotten by with it fine, but Tom Hanks needed a friend and he needed someone to talk with. And so that, that creation in the narrative of these uh, repeated kinds of uses of Tov is probably due to the originally oral nature of this. Uh, that this is recording history long back into the patriarchal era before Moses, and that's 500 years before Moses. And we're not sure there was writing, or it's certainly not Hebrew writing at that point. And so this was probably an oral tradition that was passed along uh, for many, many generations. And then Moses is the one who takes that oral composition and writes it down. Uh, that's in all likelihood what happened. And so uh, note then the, uh, the earth that's made in Genesis 1 and 2, G Genesis 1 verses 1 and 2, becomes the immediate source of other creatures. You may recall that sometimes we speak kind of cavalierly about creation ex nihilo, out of nothing, because originally God, who's immaterial, creates a material order out of nothing. But then the subsequent things he makes, he normally makes out of that existing material. It's as, as though he, he gets some, uh, uh, a little bit of copper here and a little bit of another thing here and a little thing here, and now he's, he mixes them together with some water and he comes up with a blue. Right? And then he makes his painting using his blue paint. But first, he makes the st stuff out of which he makes his oils. And so we, we find that most of the th beings that are here are actually mediated through other things. The humans made out of the dust of the ground. And let the earth bring forth this, a vegetation, that kind of a thing. So it's only the original material order in God's eyes that is the substance out of which he makes everything else. And the reason I mention that is because the, uh, the uh, the moment in which we live witnesses a profound uh, reaction against our material uh, fixedness uh, so that we can even change our biological sex, for instance, right? The Bible has no such disregard for the material order, right? We are not heads on a stick, according to the Bible, nor hearts on a stick, right? We're bodies, and we are embodied humans. And God looks at the embodied human and sees that it's very good. It's very good. And so um, 
We are as good in the divine scheme of things as blues and greens and browns are to Rembrandt. That's when he needs to do his work. So he first makes what he needs to do his work, and then he does his work. And so the human is also that way. It's very significant to realize that we are actually, many aspects of creation are made from aspects that were there before. And even the expression plants yielding seeds tends to suggest that God is built in order in which some things that exist produce other things that exist. That's the way it would be. Um, and so that kind of thing is uh, pertinent to the narrative throughout. And note then, uh, this is my fourth observation, the entire cosmos emerges from divine speech. And so this is our uh, friendly discourse, uh, discourse and conversation with our friends who are deconstructionist. Uh, we said the biblical narrative does not present speech to us as incompetent at conveying reality, but it actually says reality comes out of speech. Now, in this case, divine speech, right? But uh, nonetheless, there's a perfect correspondence in the mind of God between the thing he makes and the label he assigns to it. It, is, it, it accords perfectly in his mind that he knows what he's doing, and, and, and it puts that way. So um, we, we're familiar with this, uh, the, psalm, the 33rd Psalm, by the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, and so forth. And then uh, John, you see, reflects on the Genesis narrative by beginning his gospel as Genesis begins, and then he alters it, doesn't it? In the beginning was the word. Right, and he calls the incarnate Son Word, because he's such a manifestation of the message of God's redemptive care for His creation. So he could have called him anything else, but he calls him, in fact, uh, a kind of a divine speech. Uh, that he is present in creation as God's speaking in Genesis one is present in creation, and by Him all things that uh, that exist exist. Then note these several things five through ten. That. Uh, we might read in passing because, you know, as we read the Bible, we don't, we don't, we don't look at it always. I, I recommend looking at it. We, we normally look for. There's something we wanted to say. We need encouragement one day. We need to be rebuked the next day and so forth. We need to learn how to be a better husband or wife the next day and so forth. So we kind of look for things in the Bible. So it's like Wittgenstein's duck rabbit. If you look at it one way, it's a duck. If you look at it the other way, it's a rabbit. Depends on what you're looking for. Uh, so a lot of times when we're reading the Bible, there are things in there that apparently the writers of the Bible thought were important, and we're just rolling our eyes, right? This guy needs an editor, right? We need to get Tom O'Boyle in there to cut the guy's prose down to size, right? That uh, we got to get in there and chop some of this stuff away here. But I would say the two most, quote, boring parts of the Bible, which I know that you won't call boring because you're good Christian people, right? And you're adults. But ask 11 or 12-year-olds what are the most boring parts of the Bible, and you're likely to get the description on the building of the tabernacle and all the stuff that goes in it and the fine haberdashery of the Levitical priests, right? I mean, down to the last element on the robe and so forth. They find that boring, and, and it's the generations, right? And they finally survive Genesis as they go through ten sets, right? And they go, I had enough of that. I'm skipping over the New Testament. <laughs> and then how does Matthew 1, 1 begin? These are the generations... <laughs> of Jesus Christ, right? And you go, oh my gosh, out of the frying pan into the fire, right? You go, right? So you can see Matthew 1 emulating the Genesis, now, right? So now these are the generations of the world. It's still the world that is. It's not the world to come. But in the figure of Jesus Christ, the world that now is will become the world that is to come. And so he's as pivotal to the overall biblical narrative, you see, as Adam was in the beginning, and that's why it's presented that way. So, uh, uh, this is how the whole thing works, and, and note some of the things that God does. He separates some realms, realms from other realms. It doesn't just say that he made light in the darkness, but he separated the light from the darkness. That is to say, in the biblical account of reality, it's not wrong to call some things this and some things that, right? We... We make a distinction between a marsupial and a non-marsupial. Some of them carry their children around the stomach, right? And some of them don't. Now, those of us who don't carry children around our stomach, we get envious. And in our 60s, we develop what looks like a pouch that's carrying children. <laughs> but I think it's more beer-induced than child-induced at that point. Um, and so uh, the, the Bible doesn't hesitate to call things different things and to say that God separated this thing from that sort of a thing. That's, that's what it does. 
And he makes orderly seasons in the making of the heavenly lights, which people used before they had calendars and stopwatches and smartphones and so forth. We call the moon a mooth because it's made out of the moon, right? When the moon comes around once, it's a mooth. Uh, and so uh, we have sun day and moon day and these kinds of things. We, we measure life by those uh, constant realities after the flood of Genesis when there will be seed time and harvest, summer and winter. And so that's built into the created order for that to be the case. And so he makes these orderly uh, seasons. He also rules by fiat. This is not Sisyphus working his way up a hill with a rock. And then every time he takes a break, the rock rolls back down. He just says, let light be and light was. Let light be and light was. Uh, it's just a remarkable thing. So he's presented as a sort of majestic monarch whose word is good and whose word is gold. And he just speaks things into existence. That's just how he works. And so he assigns uh, language to these things, and he rules by fiat. Uh, let this be, let that be, and so forth. And he also rules by calling. You see, he assigns purpose in some sense to things by what he calls them. And so uh, he, he, he not only speaks before he makes, he makes, and then he speaks afterwards. And he assigns some meaning to the thing that is made by, by his calling it something. He calls the light day, calls the darkness night, and so forth calls the dry land earth, and he called the things that were gathered together in the water, he called them seas. And then he rules by distinguishing species or kinds. So I think our Swedish friend died in 1787, didn't he? Carl Linnaeus. And remember that almost all people who chase, chase down uh, bi biology now especially zoology, they go back to Linnaeus's, uh, uh, what is it, uh, species and genre, and genre, not genre, but uh, he has, what, what are the two ma major categories? Gen genus and species, but then he has phyla and so forth too, doesn't he? He goes further and further. But the names that we give are the two named things that go back to Carl Linnaeus. And so Carl Linnaeus may or may not have been biblically informed. He was Swedish and certainly in a Christian nation. Uh, but certainly, when he undertook his task of distinguishing one species from another, he was undertaking the task of following God's thoughts after God. That God has designed things as different from other things, reproductively and biologically. And so he distinguishes these species. And so each according to its kind is a repeated phrase in the Genesis narrative. That kinds are different, species are different. And, and so... Uh, uh, to do this is to recognize uh, divine order and things. And then he also appoints sub-rulers. Towards the end of it, in the sixth day, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So in the image of God, he made them. Male and female, he made them. And he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and the creeping things that creep upon the face of the earth. And so he appoints us as sub-rulers. But notice earlier in the creation narrative, he does this with the lights, doesn't he? The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. Isn't that interesting? To use the language of ruling? <laughs> uh, it's the same language that's used later for the Hebrew judges who would go out and rule or judge. They use the term judge and rule interchangeably because they didn't distinguish three branches of government. And so all of their rulers were just called judges. That's what they were. And so the lights do this. Now, when we have children and grandchildren and they say uh, on a nice, beautiful uh, winter evening and they look up and see the moon, uh, what, Mom, Dad, why did God make the moon? And uh, so we're too sophisticated to give a biblical answer, of course. And so we give that much more sophisticated answer, ask your mother. <laughs> that, and uh, so we send them off to the other spouse, of course. Uh, but I don't think I ever said to our daughters or yet to our grandsons, two and a half because one's on the way in October, I don't think if they've asked Papa, what's, why did God make them? And I don't think I ever said, to rule the, the night, right? We come up with some other thing, you know, it helps fishermen and, and it helps these people and so forth and uh, prevents birds from running into each other, whatever it is. Look, two owls had a collision in the forest. Uh, so uh, we, we uh, but the biblical language is he made the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. You see, because any great king in the ancient Near East would not have done all of his own bidding. He would have had others do his bidding for him. He would have been the head of a great administrative bureaucracy, not as inefficient as ours, of course, 
but that's what he would have done, right? And so uh, who did Jesus say was close to the kingdom? I am a man in authority, and I have people under my authority, right? And he said he's not far from the kingdom. He understood that that's built into God's order, that there is this supreme authority above all things, and then subordinate authorities moving down the scale of the ladder all the way to the bottom. And the centurion understood that, right? If nothing else, he understood that the, that the, that the reality that we live in is ordered, and God's the big dog, as it were, at the top of the pile, and then there's lesser dogs. He's the alpha, and then there's others all the way down. And, and that's the way it's presented to us. Now, each of those 10 features is true to the whole creation narrative, right? These features are revealed throughout, and I would su suggest, and we will come back to this again and to Genesis 2, I would suggest then any time you or I grow in our capacity to perceive life as God perceives it or to order it as he orders it, we are flexing the muscles of the image of God, right? And so it is always right to perceive in God's creative order what's actually there by him, to exercise dominion over it, to nourish it and bring it to fruition the way God would have us do it. And it's also right for us to even appreciate people who do it even if we don't. We can't be a master of all traits. There are certain things we have to surrender. I, for instance, gave up a lucrative career in the NBA in order to teach Greek. <laughs> can't do everything, right? But then Shaq can't parse Greek verbs, right? So fair enough, right? So he's a large, talented black man, and I'm a small, untalented white person, but I know Greek better than Shaq, right? <laughs> that, uh, so, uh, so what happens is the human does not have to do everything. It's not good for the man to be alone. We're joined together in this corporate project of reflecting the image of God and taking care of his created order. But we try to grow in, throughout our life in appreciating those who do things that we don't. So, and I still don't play cello, and probably won't until the next life, uh, mercifully, for the sake of those present. Um, uh, but I would say in the last 25 to 30 years, my ability to appreciate good music, well-composed and well-performed, grows every year. If a year comes when T. David can't mention some recordings of a good piece of music that he learned just that year, it's time for me to go fishing with Simon Peter, right? So, by the way, the new one is the uh, fourth movement of Mahler's fifth the Adagietto movement is just st staggering. It's just a magnificent piece of music. I've probably listened to it 25 or 30 times in the last four months. And, and it's just such a shock when it appears, you see, because the first movement is heroically brass, and the second and third movements are pre pre predominantly brass, and then you have these wonderful strings in the Adagietto movement that just come out of the blue. It's just a staggering piece of music, just a stunning kind of a thing. And then we return to the brass in the fifth movement, the final movement. So it's a really remarkable piece. And if you're not constantly noticing what a good world that God made, how, isn't it wonderful that he's given us this and people who devote themselves to it, then you're stagnating as a human. And so part of the joy is there's no real need ever to be bored in God's order if you understand what he wants us to become, what he wants us to do, what he wants us to appreciate, and what he wants us to celebrate. And we can grow in our capacities to do that uh, each year. So I'm not playing cello, but I can sharpen my axe, my hatchet, my tomahawk, and my knives better than I used to. Uh, I managed to get 22 and a half degrees on each side, and so they cut nicely and so forth. By the way, that's why most knife sharpeners are, are put on a 22 and a half degree, because anyone can figure out 90 degrees. It's pretty easy to cut that in half and get 45. And you cut that a half again, you get 22 and a half. So at some point, that became the convention for knife sharpening. Uh, was just do it at a 25 and a half because if you're just holding an Arkansas stone, you can kind of compute it out and get it right because it won't be straight if it's 30 on one side and 22 and a half on the other. That's the secret to it. So uh, we, uh, we grow in various kinds of areas and hope that God will permit others to do others. Tom's calling us uh, to a close. If you put questions in there to ask, I'll let you ask them next week. We had a lot to cover this week, right? But uh, thank you for your attentiveness, and the Lord willing, we'll be back together next week and tackle Genesis 1. Thanks.